Okay, welcome and thank you everybody for being here. I'm uh, very happy and very proud to, uh, to start the first uh, seminar of our new project. Um, this year we titled uh, this uh, project AI Society and Innovation. And uh, <clears throat> as you can read from uh, uh, the, our website, that will be, this is a new website that will be the, the, the main point where all the, the news and the materials, the videos of the seminars and uh, everything will be there. So please <clears throat> uh, memorize it. Um, so the, the project is about educating students, scholars, so ourselves, that's why we are here also, to deal with the real world issues. So <clears throat> many of us study physics, maybe informatics, mathematics, or law. And uh, of course, we have to uh, have a theoretical background on, the, on all the issues that we study. But of course, we want to try to understand what are the implications on the real world. And in particular, we want to understand what are the artificial intelligence implications. Last year, uh, maybe some of you know, we have tackled <coughs> the problem uh, of what are <coughs> the implications of the big data. What are big data and how they are uh, changing our world. Okay, if you didn't uh, <coughs> attend the, the seminars in the website, there are the possibility to, to, of the video, or the link to the video of the previous seminars. And <coughs> as I said this year, uh, basically the, the project will be structured on a cycle of seminar, roughly one every month, um, um, inviting speakers from international academic institutions, and companies and startup like today. Um, there will be a short course for um, free for, uh, uh, for you about internship and innovation. And also we will have a connection with the startup that is a, um, a challenge uh, in Veneto to propose ideas, okay? So who of you is interested also to have a, a deeper knowledge on uh, how you have to plan a startup, uh, what are the steps. This will be done probably around March, okay? Um, one every two months, roughly, we have the innovator talk, so like today, because we will meet someone actually involved in an innovation project. And uh, the project uh, will end in November with uh, three days in Bressanone. Okay, covered by the project by University of Padova. Um, <clears throat> in this project, we will uh, 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 try to have three days of uh, intensive interdisciplinary collaboration, working groups, to try to really propose idea to, to solve some proposed real world problems. Okay, so this is the structure of the, of the project for the whole year. And uh, <clears throat> the thematics, the topics, will be, among others, automation, so as today, um, you, we know that inter artificial intelligence is changing the way in which we are thinking to automation, but also medicine, so the impact of uh, uh, artificial intelligence on, on medicine. And this is interesting because open the possibility also for people coming uh, outside of this specific field, but to contribute and work in this field. As already said, <coughs> we will uh, focus on uh, how artificial intelligence can be used to boost innovation, and this mainly through examples of people doing this, okay? And uh, <clears throat> now I want to uh, introduce uh, my colleague and friend, Andrea Pin, who also last year proposed uh, the project of Big Data, and uh, also Lamberto Ballane, this year uh, got involved in our project, so now we are three departments, the leading of this project. And uh, <clears throat> I now lead the, the presentation to Andrea. Hello, everyone. Uh I am a strange animal, I'm a lawyer. And I'm here to learn as well as to help you learn. And um, since lawyers are very, very sharp and boring, I'd like you to do something for us, first of all. Um, so in order to select participants for the Bressanone or Brixen, as the German word goes, we will need to find out who was uh, a regular attendant, attendee of the program. 
So please go to sleed.do. Do that now, please. Could you do that? So we can keep track of you, OK? OK, and then. No, but I can, no, 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 that's fine, that's fine. Um, and type the number you see. And then just please follow the instruction. If it doesn't work, I will see you. Okay, good, it's, it's working. So we, we, we are going to keep track of who is attending our program. And if we have a, a large amount of people who apply for Brixen, we'll also make selection based on how regularly you attended the program itself. Okay, is anybody missing? Have you all done that? Are you done? Okay, thank you. Um, and now, just a very, very quick uh, outline of what's gonna happen within the next month. Uh, big guys, uh, some of them clearly uh, are not part of my expertise, Frank Pasquale, Woodrow Hartzog, and Richard Sullivan are part of my expertise. Frank Pasquale is a big name in AI and law, and he's going to talk about AI, law, and health, so healthcare. Uh, Woodrow Hartzog wrote a very compelling book about privacy. What do you mean by, what do we mean by privacy? Think of all times that something pops up when you open a website, okay, and says, do you accept cookies? We all know that. So somebody nailed down how much time it will take if you were to read all the requests. Do you know how much time is needed? 67 days per year. It's called privacy by default in the sense that there's a default of privacy. Too much privacy requests, so you're just going to say, hello, I'm fine, and you're now, you're utterly unprotected. Third, Richard Sullivan, uh, Court of Appeal of New York, uh, Federal Court. It's a, it's a court that has handled most of cases that involve AI, from predictive justice to the use of evidence, digital evidence, which is a big issue. I give the floor to my friends now. Um, Lamberto Ballan is a math guy, is a, a data science guy, and when he's speaking, I never understand what he says, but I'm here for that. Okay, cool. That's not good, actually, but anyway. Okay, so uh, just a few words uh, about the other invited speakers that are coming in the next uh, months. So we have a couple, uh, and. We have also other people that are not confirmed yet, so keep uh, track of what's happening in, on the website. Uh, but anyway, among them we have another uh, two or three talks, uh, in particular Mauro Prina and Carlo Del Mutto, that like the talk of today are mostly focused on innovation. So these are people uh, applying and using uh, AI techniques in different fields. While uh, Timit Jebru and Edmund Awad are two researchers from, uh, actually Timit Jebru is uh, the co-lead of the ethical AI group at Google Research, while Edmund Awad is one of the guy that worked on the moral machine paper that maybe you have heard about. That is, and both of them are uh, involved in research uh, uh, of what is the impact and uh, what are the main uh, limitation problems uh, arising in the application of uh, AI at the societal level. So just 
reminder. So this is the next talk uh, that is going to happen uh, uh, at the beginning of February. And there, uh, in this talk, uh, Timnit is going to introduce some of her recent work uh, on, uh, let's say, how to improve uh, the actual uh, uh, frameworks uh, that very often, machine learning frameworks, uh, that very often uh, have problems uh, related to uh, bi bias, uh, social bias in particular, and how to design or to think uh, new strategies uh, that can hopefully uh, improve the actual, uh, uh, the actual systems. And this is gonna happen on uh, February the 3rd at the math department. I think that's it for now. And so I'll just a few words before the, before the talk. <laughs> yes, thanks. So this is also the, the, the channel through which you can remain in contact, okay? So we will put also this presentation in the website so you can check it. And now I'm, thank you for the patient. I'm uh, finally introducing our speaker. Tommaso, Jacqueline, and uh, as he will uh, uh, present to us, is the founder, the inventor of Next Future. And uh, I'm very pleased that we can start our uh, um, journey uh, with the presentation of an ex-alumni of the University of Padova. In particular, uh, Tommaso attended the, the physics department for three years in his bachelor uh, um, in his bachelor, and then also, as he will explain, he also then go through a path of industrial design, and then he started to create innovation. So I'm really thank you that you are here, and uh, um, thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here. It's a pleasure for me to be again in this big room and uh, on the other side of the room. Let me connect my computer one second. Okay. So, again, as Samir was saying, uh, I studied the physics for the bachelor degree here uh, about 10 years ago. And then afterwards, uh, I went to uh, U of the University of Architecture in Venice, and I did uh, another bachelor degrees in uh, industrial design. And many people ask, why did you go? Did you went from uh, physics study to uh, industrial design? And my general answer is because uh, after the theoretical studies, my main goal was to create something real, create some kind of. Uh, a service or a product that can uh, showcase what you can do with all the things that you learn when you did, uh, uh, let's say, hardcore uh, math, physics, uh, and uh, sciences. So, um, as you see here, this is uh, uh, one of the very first renderings that I did uh, uh, after the graduation in uh, industrial design because uh, this was part of my graduation thesis in industrial design, but in some sort uh, it's uh, uh, an idea that was born here in, uh, when I was studying physics because uh, it was related to complex systems. Why do people today travel in this old-fashioned way? What does it mean? It doesn't mean that uh, you need to travel uh, with electric cars or uh, with self-driving cars because uh, it's the paradigm completely different. It's the paradigm that needs to shift somehow because uh, the main difference, it's not the way you travel, but it's how these vehicles and how the people that are inside these vehicles collaborate together. So this is, uh, so to say, our solution it's not to create uh, a standard vehicle that can do what uh, humans are already capable to do, so for example, self-driving vehicles, but we want to create vehicles that can interact with each other and can collaborate with each other to create some uh, new kind of mobility. How we do this? Here you see a very brief video that uh, I did uh, many years ago before having any physical uh, prototype. 
And the idea is to create this kind of cell, this kind of room on wheels, that it's, uh, is uh, dynamics. It's based on uh, the, all the requests and all the variables that uh, are, that are given by the environment. For example, in this case, they dock together, they open the door, and the people can move between uh, these wagons, these vehicles connected together. And uh, uh, the app on the phone will give you instruction on where to take seats. Then afterwards, they detach. And depending on the, the set of destination, they go to the final destination. Here you see how they can consolidate together in a single vehicle. We will speak about this later. And finally, since they are rooms on wheels, you can put services inside. So instead of having services that cost because they occupy space, in this vision, they, they cost much, much less because they occupy time. So let's go direct to the main, uh, let's say, innovation of this. The innovation is not the self-driving technology, because of course we are not the only one making self-driving vehicles. Google is doing self-driving vehicles. Tesla is doing self-driving vehicles. A lot of companies in the world, they are doing self-driving vehicles. So this is the reason why we focused on something that it's, in our opinion, much more interesting than just taking away the driver. It's the capability for these units, these vehicles, to collaborate together and having doors on the front and on the back so when they dock together, the people can move between them. So this is the core of the innovation and this is, the, let's say, the founding element for everything that comes afterwards. So the entire dynamics of the system, it's based on this part here. What does it imply? This it implies that you have in the first and last mile something that it's ubiquitous as a taxi because you can use just one unit for semi-private service. So you order the vehicle and like a taxi or a Uber service, it will come directly to you. So it's a point-to-point, door-to-door system that it's lowering a lot the friction of cost so the stress that the passenger uh, wants to have during his trip. But then afterwards, this become efficient as a bus. Not only because uh, these vehicles will dock together having one person per each unit, because it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I mean, if you have one person in each unit, you're just saving a little bit of space, but not that much. But when they dock together, they function as an interchange stop station. So basically, what now happens at, for example, bus stops, so you go to the bus stop with the first bus and then you take another one, or with the metro station, it happens this kind of interchange between modes. Here it happens inside the same vehicles that come to pick you up. So basically, you never go out of the vehicles from the, the first step out of your house to the final step into the office at the morning, for example. And then it's, uh, as you've seen in the video, it's comfortable as a lounge because inside each unit you can put whatever you want. For example, uh, Starbucks can be put inside these vehicles and if you're going, for example, from uh, uh, here to Milan because you have a meeting there, instead of uh, the need to stop on an uh, auto grid, for example, you can have uh, services that will join with your vehicle in motion and deliver to you the service that you need. <clears throat> okay, for example, let's, uh, let's try to figure out in a simplified way how it works. Here you see that from uh, a sparse area, a very low density residential area in Dubai that's called Sharjah. Many vehicles with just one or two people inside, very similar to a taxi, they go to a consolidation, a feeder station. 
but they use this, exactly the same vehicles. So, so they pass through all the cabins and they go to the, to the head ones. And when uh, the two head units are completely full of people, then this will behave as a, as a bus and will detach from uh, the tail. And the other units on the tail, let me stop a little, one second the video, will go to pick up other person. So the residual capacity of this that can be called as an hybrid uh, taxi bus system, it's uh, very, very high, where uh, uh, most of uh, the origin and destination uh, <coughs> requests uh, is going to be mu uh, much more uh, uh, probable. So here you see the difference. If all of the first uh, vehicles that you've seen would have been uh, proceed uh, to, to the final destination, you would have uh, 12 taxi instead of uh, just two units. This means that you have uh, 12, uh, even if you have the driver, you have 12 drivers occupied for 100% of the time. With our system, you have uh, 12 drivers occupied for 10% of the time. Then the remaining 90% of the time, you have just uh, one tenth of the vehicles occupied. And uh, here it's clear also the, the traffic footprint that it's uh, about 80 to 90% less than if you use a traditional taxi system. So then, of course, they can split to go to a couple of destinations. And this is, this is the, let's say, simplified scenario results. About three times, uh, it really depends on the distance between the low density area and the high density area in the center of the city. So it's very depending on the geometry of the city. Uh, the traffic cut, it's amazing because uh, you can move uh, 18 people in five meters instead of 60 meters. And uh, even if you have, and I want to stress this, so this does not require self-driving to be implemented. This can have up to 50% uh, driver cost saving because you can move uh, more than twice the number of people with the same number of drivers. So to summarize, instead of having, uh, let's say, the traditional uh, uh, layout of your trip with the public transportation means or uh, with, uh, with uh, your private car or uh, a taxi, instead of having to go to the, the closest station, then wait for the bus. If you maybe you are not uh, a daily commuter, you need to understand what the bus that you need to take. Then, of course, stop multiple times. And then, again, uh, up to your final stop, you need to walk up to the destination. Each one of these steps increases a lot the um, friction cost. This is the um, transportation terms. This is the, the uh, let's say, the technical terms to, to um, let you understand what's the level of stress compared to the price that these people are uh, willing to, to take. So this is the reason why most of the people in uh, big cities where the cost of taxi are uh, slightly lower, like Dubai, for example, they most of the time take taxi. Because on one side, um, the weather in the city, it's extremely hot. So you, one minute outside generates a lot of friction, a lot of stress for the user. On the other side, the typical taxi fare, it's uh, about uh, half the cost, even less than it's here in uh, Europe, uh, especially in Italy. So this is the reason why most of the time in Dubai you have in the morning the commuters from the residential areas to the center of the city creating and generating a lot of uh, a queue, a lot of traffic in the main roads. And this is very interesting in, in terms of statistics to see why these people are doing this and what's the effect on the artery roads, on uh, the geometry of the city how these uh, vehicles are like agents that uh, with a slightly different uh, uh, paradigm, they can, uh, of course, optimize a lot uh, 
the, the traffic and the behavior. So this is the reason why we are taking the best part uh, of the taxi, so the very, very low friction in the first mile, and we are mixing this with the high density where it's really required, so where uh, we need to move a lot of people at the same time, for example, in the center of the city or in Dubai, um, in, uh, in proximity of the mall and the uh, commercial areas. So this is based on what uh, I've uh, so called uh, car jumping. So the idea came into my mind when I was studying physics, and it was uh, when you see a, a very big simulation of uh, traffic agents going from uh, uh, the suburbs of the city to the center of the city, you see that for roughly 10% of the time, uh, they stay relatively far from each other because they are in low density areas. But when you go um, towards the center of the city, you go to the main arteries, the main roads. And when these vehicles are on the main roads and you label them depending on uh, the distance uh, from the destination that they have, the distance between the destination, you see that most of these cars are uh, very close to each other from uh, the very beginning of the main road when they are going to the center of the city. So why don't people can, uh, as soon as they are close enough, jump to the car of the, of, uh, the, that it's next to you if it's going to the same destination? And so instead of having two cars going to the same destination, just one car with two people and the other one is freed up. So, of course, the reason why this is probably not, uh, okay, so this is the difference. Instead of congesting the center, you jump into the car, and just the car full of people, it's going to the center of the city. Okay, so w why this? It's a very good uh, theoretical, uh, theoretical uh, study, theoretical idea, but of course, it's, of course it's not feasible because uh, you need to move these people between the cars that uh, probably needs to have uh, intermediate uh, parking stations uh, or, uh, or they need to jump from one car to the other, so it's completely impossible to do. And then uh, how these people are capable to know which one is the car to go in. It's a massive uh, complexity if you do this with uh, traditional cars. And how do you convince uh, uh, strangers to stay inside a traditional car? A taxi typically, if you fit inside two people, maybe you have some kind of privacy, but if you fit three, four people, there is no space anymore. So this is the reason why after, so to say, the idea that uh, STEM when I was in physics, um, it, there was the need for something uh, different for uh, what we called uh, in uh, industrial design user-centered design. So start from the very needs of the user to, and go on top of it and try to understand what's the best solution in terms of the hardware, the software, and the service to accomplish some kind of task. So this is how the, um, the idea of having this kind of cubes on wheels, these rooms on wheels came into my mind, and uh, this is the reason why the layout, uh, it's, uh, it's like a lounge, it's not like a very uh, tight bus. And uh, you are able with this big corridor in the middle to easily move from one vehicle to the other in a completely safe and um, closed environment. So it's completely, for example, for Dubai, there is uh, air conditioning inside. So this is another formal overview of how uh, carpooling can be uh, maximized and optimized with this system. And the reason why carpooling is not uh, that interesting at the moment. So, um, at the moment, uh, carpooling is not efficient enough and it's not used enough uh, for a quite simple reason. Reason is that uh, mm, to go to pick up many people uh, around the origin point, there is uh, 
a slightly low probability that you find people going to the same destination. So you need to uh, double or uh, um, quadruple uh, the time that you need to wait if you are, for example, the first one to be picked up to pick up other people going to the same destination. But if you go to an in the intermediate road where you, where you have a high probability to stumble upon other people that are going to the main destination, you can pick up people from the origin points even if they are going to a slightly different destination. The only requirement that you have is that in the main road you have a slightly higher probability to have other people going to this destination. So, you do the consolidation and the redistribution of uh, the passengers inside the main road, that uh, it's uh, really lowering the time that you need to wait, because basically you are starting from uh, your very own house and you're going to the destination and you never stops in the middle. So after the redistribution of the people, uh, then they detach and they go to the next destination. So for example, think about uh, going from the suburbs of Padua to the suburbs of Milan, okay? Of course, in the middle on the A4 uh, um, highway, you will uh, have a high probability to stumble upon someone that is going in several places around Milan. So. It's very interesting, the idea to take people from the suburbs of Padua and bring them to the suburbs of Milan, redistributing them in the middle of the road. Um, an interesting thing is that uh, New York University, uh, they saw our, uh, say, marketing stuff, our vehicles on, uh, on the internet, uh, and they tried to um, implement and, and to study a slightly more simplified uh, version of our algorithm. And they call it with, with linking. So basically, it, they, they call it in-route transfer. On, uh, on, the, on the left side, you see what uh, carpooling uh, uh, are doing. So similar to here. So the, in uh, A, B, C, D, they are taking four people. But these four people are going to all the four destinations. So each uh, origin needs to be connected to all the four destinations. If you use an intermediate point uh, E, an intermediate point J, to consolidate the people depending on the destination and then you split them on the, uh, the, the intermediate point of the destination, the results are quite interesting. Let me go to the results, yeah. These are the results. So uh, if you are using an, a traditional carpooling system, a non-modular, so you cannot uh, redistribute the passengers between the vehicles, you, are having, you need to go to all the four destinations every time. So you, need, you, are, you have an average um, distance traveled by the entire fleet of 91 kilometers. Uh, but to move the same amount of people, uh, if you redistribute them in the middle, you have uh, only 32 kilometers. So it's uh, uh, more than 60% less distance travel by the entire fleet to do this. What does it mean? It means that uh, in, if you use this for uh, morning commuting or, uh, um, yes, mainly morning commuting because uh, evening commuting it's a little bit different, but if you use, use this for morning commuting, you can move uh, two to three times the people that you move uh, with a traditional uh, taxi service or carpooling service. And, um, okay, now, now you can see. So this is a very simplified version of uh, the, the algorithm to showcase what, what's happening. So basically, one vehicle is uh, continuously going to the destination, but uh, some other vehicles are feeding the main uh, unit. And this is, uh, let's say, with, with, uh, with only, oh, there is too much light, but maybe you see that, with only 20 vehicles, you start seeing some kind of uh, um, emergent behaviors that in this uh, animation here, you see it seems like a breath 
So these vehicles are uh, going to the secondary road, picking up the people, and then merging on the main roads, um, filling only the, the minimum amount of vehicles needed to fit that number of people, and then going to the center of the city. And then afterwards, the freed up uh, vehicles, they are spreading again on the secondary road, taking other people and merging again on the main road. Then finally, let's try to think a little bit more about the side, so to say, businesses. So how these agents, how these vehicles can uh, implement new kind of services that uh, with traditional vehicles are impossible. For example, in this case, uh, again for Dubai, we, um, we thought about uh, what if the airport comes to, comes to you instead of uh, you go to the airport. So having services like uh, check-in, security check, baggage drop, doing this service inside vehicles, while you're going to your airplane, and instead of going inside the, the terminal of the airport. So the first uh, part of the video, it's uh, like it was before, you are consolidating a lot of people going to the same destination. Then afterwards, when all these people are consolidated in the same bus, so to say, you can uh, dock together few units that inside they fit uh, different services. For example, in this case, there is a, a bag check system, a safety check, and there is a person that is picking up the baggages and store it for you. Then afterwards, on the back of uh, these uh, service vehicles, you have uh, some more place to fit the people that already do this procedure. Another interesting part is uh, after they did the check-in, they can be uh, hosted in a very comfortable environment with uh, services like duty-free and uh, restaurant or cafe. But the interesting part here is that since you have the profile of each of these uh, passengers, you know precisely what's uh, the best things that you need to put in this very, very limited space. So it's not anymore trying to have uh, as much as possible space inside the terminal uh, to sell this kind of things, but it's more on tailoring the, the product that you are selling. As you see, they didn't stop by the terminal. They go directly to the aircraft because they, they already did all the security checking. And so they can go directly inside the airplane. Inside the airfield, they can uh, already, it's a little bit uh, simpler, to have a fully self-driving system. So the baggage pod will go directly to embark the baggages. Same thing can happen in, uh, at, the, at the arrival. So the baggage pod will take baggages of the first class. Of course, this, when you have just few vehicles, it will be a very high premium service. So the, the first class passengers will dock directly with the, with the pod and will go directly to the to the to the taxi service, the final destination, the uh, the hotel, uh, the parking spaces. So this system here, for example, using the this kind of interaction between agents between vehicles, can optimize the embarking and disembarking time by one uh, one point five hours. Then finally, <clears throat> another interesting scenarios that can be optimized with this modular interaction system can be related to the logistics of packages. So you do not necessarily need to move passengers to optimize the system. You can move also packages. So the first part of the video, it's quite uh, common today. So you have uh, AGV, self-driving robots inside warehouses. 
they are moving packages inside these big warehouses. But the, this is not the, the real innovation. The real innovation is that uh, these uh, uh, cells, these um, modules, the vehicles, are basically a slice of warehouses that you can uh, place in motion on uh, consolidated trucks. So you see here, for yeah, in uh, in situation like uh, interports or uh, industrial areas, they already can move completely driverless. Then outside of it, they need to have a driver in the front one, but uh, you can have. Uh, this solution here, that it's basically a shuttle that it's uh, docking to the back of uh, the main truck, exchanging packages that they need uh, to uh, deliver in the local area. So you're using exactly the same robots that you're using inside the static warehouses, but you're using this on, uh, let's say, mobile warehouses. Then they undock and the shuttle vehicle that it's absolutely identical to all the other vehicles, it's going to the final customer. And it works as a, let's say, locker that it's coming to you. Then, of course, when you have a fully self-driving capability, all these units can detach from the main truck, and they already have inside the packages um, consolidated based on the destination. So you don't need to move them again, for example, from a big truck. Today you, you need to start from the big truck, unload the big truck, and load the small trucks that they need to deliver in, inside the city. So in terms of uh, cost saving and time saving, uh, it's a very interesting solution. So finally, I'm very happy to tell you that this is not just uh, 3D CGI rendering, but it's a full functioning vehicle. That we, this, is, these are, this is the docking in motion. These are the vehicles that we manufacture for the city of Dubai, for the government of Dubai, about one year and a half ago. This is how they steer together as a single rigid unit because all the wheels are steering and are moving in a synchronized way. Of course, the doors close before undocking, but this is for filming purposes. And uh, you see in the internal space, it's tailored to be very comfortable for, uh, for the passengers, so they can stay in their privacy area. They are not... Uh, assembling each other shoulders and and so this is the and this uh, is um, a testing that we did here in Padua a couple of months ago because actually our uh, facility where we build the vehicles it's in Padua in the um, industrial area of Padua so we did this first uh, try outside I was driving it because it's not legal self-driving. But the, the city of Padua gave us this area here. It's uh, close to the IKEA facility. It's a big parking lot where we can try and test the self-driving capabilities. So for now, I finish here. And if you have some question, I will be glad to answer. Thank you, Tommaso. Thank you very much. And now is uh, your time. I think uh, this is one great opportunity because uh, <clears throat> not only about the product, about Next, but also about his journey. Because ne Next is also a personal journey. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> yeah. I, I think <clears throat> you never spoke about your, the challenges that you have to tackle to arrive here. So, but I think that's some maybe very interesting uh, yes. uh, aspect. Maybe you can start and then uh, you can ask questions, please. Well, I, yeah, I, I can start yeah. for a yeah. few hours no, no, to, okay. <laughs> to talk about the entire journey, but to summarize a little bit, uh, after the graduation in uh, physics, I, as I said, go to industrial design. I did a graduation in a uh, bachelor degree in industrial design. And then afterwards, uh, um, I try to push uh, 
the concept uh, to be real, uh, mm, speaking with a few companies here in Italy, but of course uh, there was a lot of skepticism because you have a young guy all alone going there to showcase something that seems impossible. Then I went to bigger companies and they wanted a few millions to start uh, prototyping even uh, uh, just a single unit. So finally, finally, I found a co-founder in the United States. He is an Italian guy that uh, it is from Rome. So we said uh, together two Italian guys, one living in the US uh, in Silicon Valley can try to raise funds in the US. Unfortunately, it's not that easy to find uh, uh, money in Silicon Valley if you are an Italian guy that you didn't study at Stanford. So don't go there. It, it's not the, uh, the, golden, uh, the golden land if you're not uh, a student of Stanford or uh, um, something like that. So then finally we decided to go to, to do everything on our own. So he did the very first prototype in his garage in Silicon Valley with a few thousand euros. And then in Italy I found some um, um, very, very um, small sponsors, uh, companies that wanted to manufacture the vehicle based on our drawings uh, with their uh, special materials. For example, um, Onicomb Aluminum, it's a company near Milan that did uh, the static prototype. Then uh, with the help of a few very, very skilled engineers that I found here in Padua, we did the, the, the first two uh, one to 10 scale working prototypes in, uh, in, in the in the living room of, of my apartment here in Padua. And then afterwards, uh, we found a tweet from the Sheikh of Dubai featuring our uh, rendering, this one. And uh, we tried to contact the, the Sheikh of Dubai because we didn't know if uh, the right things to do was suing him or uh, thanking him. So uh, finally, um, was almost impossible to get in contact with him, so we tried to um, to participate to startups uh, challenges that are in the Arabic area, like in Dubai, for example. And uh, we won one of these challenges, so we went there for three months uh, with our small prototypes. We pitched the, to the Ministry of Transportation of Dubai. Actually, I probably have also a video of the small prototypes. Let me find it. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is the truck in the living room. And th that was the very, very first uh, small scale prototype. And uh, let's say three, four months after this video, we, we were uh, uh, in Dubai in front of the Sheikh showcasing this, showcasing the vehicles docking together, even in motion like this. And yes, basically after three months, uh, the Sheikh told us, uh, well done, but now you, want, now you want to see these vehicles in the real world with, uh, uh, let's say, real dimensions. And so we signed a contract for uh, the purchase of the first two prototypes. And we came back to Italy, and in uh, about uh, one year, we built the two vehicles that you've seen uh, in, the, uh, in the previous video. I... I also have a, um, let me see. It's very small when I connect it to. No, probably, no, prob probably it's not here. But by the way, that was uh, the naked version of the, of the prototypes here in Italy. Uh, maybe it's this one, yeah, it's this one. 
again with the, um, was very hard because uh, the, yeah this is the you see this this was the the naked prototype the first one that we built here in 2017 it was very hard we to to gather the money to do this to we have a lot of help from uh, local um, companies that uh, hosted us for free so it was a, a very big challenge, and not, not uh, that much on the technical terms, but uh, much more on the soft side, the, the soft skills like uh, having the space to do it, find the money to do it, uh, convince the institution to allow to, for this vehicle to move, or uh, I'll convince the, 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 the companies and the people that you are uh, solid enough to sell this kind of vehicles <coughs> that this is not only futuristic stuff but it's real innovation so um, we did a very long and uh, difficult journey and still it's very difficult because now we are going from uh, prototypes to fully functional uh, commercial vehicles so we need to go through crash testing uh, safety functional safety testing um, we need to do a lot of things. So we are very happy because this journey is very fundamental for our life. But uh, again, it's, uh, it's not an easy path. Another one because it takes courage to. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for your presentation. And your, uh, I mean, I don't know the the legal situation about autonomous driving uh, in, uh, in 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 cities. So, according to this, do you think at a stage in which this kind of motion can be done by human driving and then move to autonomous, or uh, or you do you plan a long term fully autonomous driving vehicles? Thank no, no, no. The the the, the reason why we are doing certification. Uh, for human driving at the moment, it's because everything that I showed you to you, so all, uh, <coughs> for example, the traffic, uh, um, the traffic um, improvement, uh, the, the cost improvement, everything, it's not related to self-driving. So everything, it's uh, always uh, um, comparing uh, the situation that we have today. So every every car uh, have a human driver every next will have a human driver to the future situation where every car will be self driving every next will be self driving so what we are trying to do is to completely disconnect the needs for self driving and uh, our uh, let's say modular advanced uh, smart uh, mobility solution Thank you, that's very cool. Uh, congratulations. Uh, I, I was wondering, so I don't know if this was planned uh, like a marketing strategy to go to the Dubai Shake first. <laughs> uh, I guess he could be impressed by the cool design, by the futuristic style, so maybe you get founded because of this. And now I'm wondering if you are also planning something more robust uh, in the use case scenarios, like you want to sell your system to a big city and you want to convince the major that the impact will indeed be an mm -hmm. advantage. So are you thinking about some theoretical analysis to show that, for example, taking the map of a city, the traffic flow, the key points, then you can estimate how much gain you will get with your system Absolutely. in order to say, okay, in this city, you will gain this much. In this other city, you will gain this much. Yes. Um, so, <laughs> regarding the design, uh, you, you like it, maybe someone else c cannot like it. Someone, they say, okay, it's just a black cube, it seems like a 3D printer. Someone else will say, oh, it's so minimal, it's very sleek and cool. But, I mean, it, we, we, the shape of the vehicle, uh, it's 100% dependent on the fact that they need to dock rigidly together. So, they need to be done this way. Um, we didn't plan the city of Dubai to be involved. 
actually it was like out of the blue that uh, the tweet of the shake was there. Actually, my first uh, idea was exactly this. So uh, I had a lot of documents showcasing how the modularity can, uh, depending on the geometry of the city, optimize uh, in some scenarios more than others. Uh, the traffic flows uh, and the number of people that you can move inside the city, the user, uh, um, let's say, capability for to, to, to take this kind of vehicles. Uh, then afterwards it moved a little bit more on the marketing side, but um, even today most of uh, the interest starts from uh, uh, the municipal companies uh, uh, doing transportation, for example. Now we are doing a project with the Genoa uh, a, a, AMT, so um, Transportation uh, Agency, because they, um, the people that are doing transportation analysis, they understand a lot the, the real uh, um, benefits that modularity and in-route transfer can give you and do not care that much on the, let's say, aesthetical side of it or uh, on the self-driving capability of it. So you said this, uh, they, they, these units need to dock um, uh, Rigidly, thanks. So how many of these can you stack together before a uh, 90 degrees turn is not viable anymore because you take most of the street? So um, all the wheels can turn up to plus 90, minus 90 degrees. So it's not really uh, depending on uh, the steering capability, it's depending on the total length of the vehicle. Up to six units, do you stay in s within uh, the boundaries of uh, typical buses. So six units, uh, you can stack them uh, all together with no problem. If you want to do something more than a typical length of a bus, you can do it. Uh, but uh, the, let's say, the articulation of the, the units, it's virtual. So when you approach to a tight uh, corner, the, the head unit will communicate to the back unit to, to close the door and disconnect, like 20, 30 centimeter. Then after the, the tight corner, they dock again. For example, for uh, long trips, like on the highway, they can stay a very, very long queue. And then uh, when they go outside of the, of the highway, they undock and then they redock again afterwards. I have another couple of questions about the software. Um, how much uh, software needs still to be uh, written for a realistic use and uh, uh, how much of the software is uh, city dependent, so it needs to be changed from one environment to the other? So the software uh, related to the self-driving, it's not something that we internally do. Uh, we do only the software related to the docking and undocking, that, that part is already being done. The software for uh, the, uh, let's say, logistics inside the city, uh, the main algorithm has been done and the simulation on city maps has been done. Of course, need to be implemented uh, with, uh, uh, let's say, back-end server part uh, that needs to have uh, real uh, origin and destination requests and real uh, traffic flows and traffic data to be implemented completely. So that part needs to be done. But this is very interesting because we are talking with the PTV, the, the PTV group. It's the company making the most famous uh, software for traffic uh, simulation, vSIM. And uh, we are talking with them because uh, it would be very interesting to um, have Next as a standard asset inside. So for city planners, instead of just placing uh, bus lines or a taxi, um, taxi parking spaces, you can place also virtual lines, so to say, of the next uh, vehicles inside. So we are trying to make a very solid uh, um, group of companies that can uh, put this thing into the market uh, on, a, on a very solid strategic way. 
To this regard, Thomas, you were, <clears throat> when we were speaking, you were mentioning also the possibility for someone interested in the future to maybe have a thesis or an in yes. internship. Maybe you want to... Yes, exactly. So if someone, uh, since also New York, uh, already New York University did a study on us, and um, South Florida University did another study on our system. Um, Brisbane, uh, Australian University did another study more related to uh, the transportation side. It will be an honor for us that someone from Padua, that it's our origin city, can do some kind of studies uh, related to what we do, for example, uh, the dependency of uh, the geometry of the city, let's say comparing a European, typically European cities to a typical US city a geometry and try to understand what are the levels of optimization in the two, in the two uh, scenarios. That can be, for example, a good uh, thing that uh, can be done by a university study or a thesis, so you're welcome if you want to do something or an internship, we, we are very open. Uh, do you have an estimate of how many changes of seat one should do, let's say, in a, for an uh, uh, and move yeah. in within yes, the yes. city because this might be a limitation if I have to change the seat many times right. I, I would be pissed off so this, this is actually a variable in our algorithm so we try to lower the number of exchange of seats and generally uh, the people that has been picked up so if you are alone in one vehicle you will be moved to a vehicle with more people inside and generally you have uh, on average of just one exchange from your personal one to the, let's say, main trunk. If you're going to a very dense uh, part of the city, so for example, if you're going from your house to the central station, it's uh, on average just one exchange. If you're going, uh, as I was saying before, from the the suburbs of a big city to the suburbs of another big city, you generally have a couple of changes. One is uh, the feeder, so to say, the consolidating part of it, and another one is when you split the, 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 the consolidated wagon to many vehicles. While well, I bring the microphone to... Um, I have a question myself. So, uh, more or less, uh, what is the cruising speed of... Uh Ah, the they, they, they can go up to 90 kilometers per hour. So since we and don't... But the docking up? Oh, no. The, we, we test the docking up to 20 kilometers per hour. We tested the docking okay. because we didn't have uh, enough uh, road to test it <laughs> <laughs> uh, with higher speed. But uh, theoretically, there are no real boundaries on the speed of docking. The boundaries are on the... Uh, let's say the um, the road condition, uh, the fact that you don't you cannot do it when you are doing a corner, for example. But uh, I mean, in terms of the speed, it's not. So, what do you expect? 90, 90 kilometers per hour, and no. are there any regulation concerning the fact that people can actually move, so it's not actually secure to the seat and stuff? As 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 far as they w w go from one seat to another seat, and they will. Uh, take another seat and uh, put seat belts, there is no problem. It's like on uh, city buses. On a buses. bus. Yes. A bus. And what about the, uh, the modules that are not, uh, let's say, they, they bring like from the suburbs to the, to the main feeder? Mm -hmm. uh, when, let's say, they, they bring the, the, the users to the main feeder and then they basically they get detached, where are they parked? Where, where do they stay, let's say? They, ah, yeah. A very interesting, no, so a very I, interesting part because I believe also you need they need to get recharged, right? So yeah, yeah, you may have kind of a hubs around the. A very interesting part that we generally skip because there are a lot of things to say. It's that uh, we design the vehicles to fit inside a traditional parking space. So two units, uh, I mean one unit, it's about 2.5 meter long. Uh, it's like a cube, 2.5, 2.5, 2.9 uh, high. 
um, and they can stack together. So in a, a typical parking space that it's uh, five meters time uh, 2.5 meters, you can fit two of them. So you can park these vehicles uh, in traditional parking lots, parking spaces. And uh, for uh, bus companies, for example, this is a very interesting uh, saving uh, uh, thing because uh, you don't need to have uh, specific parking spaces for them. Another interesting part of it is that we uh, co-designed the, the base of it to fit inside uh, um, batteries that you can uh, slide out uh, and exchange. So instead of the need for uh, recharging, so stopping the vehicle for uh, a certain amount of time to recharge uh, the batteries, you can uh, switch the batteries, so swapping the batteries with, um, with a forklift, so you can uh, also do it manually, but with another company we are trying to do it automatically. Also between vehicles, so between, uh, let's say, a passenger vehicle and a recharging vehicle, you can exchange the batteries. But, I mean, at the moment we can do it manually and it will take 1.5 minutes, so it's a very easy and very fast uh, um, battery swapping system. Okay, so... Very nice presentation, thank you. Um, thank you. I have a technical question, but I'm not looking for a technical reprise, so something which is more useful for the students, for example. Okay. So, for preparing your business plan, okay, uh -huh. I guess you, you had to think about the number of next units, so mm -hmm. how did you use your background in physics to perform this kind of uh, calculations, uh, this estimation? You so, mean uh, for the business plan? Yeah, because I mean, I think that with three or four uh, next units, you do not yes. reach a, a real added value in the public transportation exactly. or not. Exactly. So, in fact, uh, the business plan uh, are divided in, uh, let's say, three steps. The first step is uh, more of a feasibility study on the city, that, of course, it's being paid. Uh, and after the feasibility study, we understand two things. So for, with the one or two vehicles, we understand uh, if uh, uh, the layout of the city can uh, host our vehicles. For example, uh, are, are the roads uh, good enough uh, to fit the vehicles? Uh, are the parking space uh, layouted in the proper way? Are the recharging spot uh, um, fair enough? Uh, this is one thing. And the other thing is, uh, uh, taking the geometry of the city and try to simulate, uh, depending on the, 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 the interest point, uh, uh, where is the best place to place them uh, and uh, three different scenarios. One is, uh, let's say, a more uh, traditional scenario when, where you use this vehicle as a traditional bus uh, in, uh, in the peak time with, uh, for example, six uh, units docked together. With, with one driver in the front one. And then after peak time, instead of uh, unusing most of the bus, you, you park, uh, let's say, slice of this bus in places where people, common people can take this as uh, car sharing vehicles. So this is a completely different business model, but it's more uh, simple for the cities and uh, with a very, very uh, small fleets of vehicles to be implemented. Then, of course, there is an intermediate scenario, and there is the, the most, uh, let's say, ideal scenario where you use this as an integrated service that can take uh, requests from uh, passengers, services, uh, commuters from uh, the borders of the city to the center of the city, uh, also um, uh, packages, distribution services. So our algorithm uh, needs to have, let's say, 100 vehicles to really perform well on this uh, side. But again, of course, if you are um, doing this business with the European cities, you need to have, so to say, a scalable business model. Physics, I mean, physics, of course, help you, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, related to the analysis of the problem, of course, that it, it, it really helps. So try to start from the problem and to find uh, the mathematical solution for the problem that uh, probably it's something that goes outside of just uh, 
optimizing the number. Maybe you need to find another side scenarios to, to make it uh, revenue proper. Yeah. Yes. Uh, are you using or planning to use some uh, AI solutions to boost your uh, um, technology? Technology? Mm, well, I mean, in I, I don't really like the word AI because uh, so we are using uh, 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 let's say machine learning layer on uh, uh, the software that it's optimizing the routes. Of course, of course, it's learning about the behavior of the people, uh, and uh, it will be much more used when you have real data feed into the machine learning uh, algorithms uh, inside. Yes. And also for uh, the data, for example, of traffic flow, do you uh, estimate it just from the topology of the network, or uh, you have a real data in the, for example, in Dubai? Um, I mean. Uh, Yes, I mean, it's, um, you can use APIs like Mapbox uh, or Google APIs, and they are quite expensive to, for the number of uh, requests that you need to put on that. So we, we do a first estimation based on the data that uh, this kind of uh, public API gives to you and uh, some other data that are given by the cities. And then we base on that, of course, uh, so to say, the level of optimization that you see here, it's at the, the base level, the level zero. So in case uh, what we are doing is exactly the same uh, of what taxi are doing, uh, but with the modularity on top of it. If you want to reach, uh, let's say, a more um, optimized uh, level uh, of the system, you can, of course, uh, use uh, uh, machine learning on real data when you have a slightly bigger fleet. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Let's say you haven't, you haven't started yet. What advice would you give to yourself? Sorry? The question I think was, uh, if you had not started yet, what kind of advice would you, would you give yourself now? Ah, uh, uh, prepare, because things will be much tougher than you probably thought. But at the same time, uh, uh, the journey is very, very fulfilling. Uh, so do it anyway, because this is the best uh, part of your life. Uh, to do these kind of things. So <laughs> put yourself in trouble uh, as soon as you can. Any other questions? Yes. Huh? Scary. <laughs> No, I mean, it's much more fulfilling that uh, if you go to do, let's say, a, s a stable and traditional job, then uh, probably after 10, 15 years, you say, what, what, what am I doing here? What is my life about? And I mean, you have ups and downs. So, but uh, in the end, it's much more challenging on one side and on the other side, it's much more fulfilling. Uh, you say that uh, uh, every model can have uh, inside six people. And yeah. um, isn't there a problem when they dock together and uh, they are not self-driving? Because with uh, the Italian driver license, you can drive cars only uh, having nine people within if you don't have a special driver license. Yes. Um, in fact, uh, this is the reason why Technically, they have six people sitting plus four people standing to reach 10 people. So you can use one unit as an M1 or M2, depending if you have standing people and a professional driver or not. So if you take this car, you alone with the B license, uh, 
you can use it only with sitting uh, people, so up to six people. If you have a professional driving license, you can have uh, also people standing and more vehicles docked together. It's a, it's a tricky stuff, but... <laughs> yeah, I mean, so th they can dock only if there is a professional... Yes, uh, yes. Okay. Okay, I think... I mean, it's more than 20 minutes of questions. I think we <laughs> we exhausted the most of them. I, mean, I, I don't know, maybe you are available. So if, uh, no, if I'm available if you want. No more. More, more questions, or let's say, more in a more private format. So uh, I would say that we thank the speaker again. <clears throat> and good luck for everything. Thank you. <laughs>